Hello, welcome to this edition of Interface. We have with us today Professor Bill Ashcroft, a professorial fellow at the School of Arts and Media, University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. Uh, Professor Ashcroft is a well known figure in postcolonial studies. In fact, uh, one of the founding fathers of postcolonial studies in English. Professor Ashcroft, uh, probably what, the, what most of uh, the students or teachers or research scholars who listen to this program would like to know is mm. what has happened since that book of yours got published, the monumental work, The mm. Empire Writes Back? Mm. Well, uh, a lot has happened. That was over 25 years ago. But um, an interesting thing was that uh, it came out in a very a, a, a decade of great change. You know, 1989 was the year the Berlin Wall came down, the year the end of the USSR. Uh, it was a year the world changed, and the world changed in a particular way uh, in the post-colonial world because the world was hungry for a language to describe the uh, uh, the diversity of cultures in um, in the world. So what uh, what happened was that at the same time as uh, post-colonial theory began to emerge, globalization studies began to emerge in the early 90s, um, issues of cosmopolitanism. But the really interesting thing was that um, social theorists got tired of the way in which globalization was being uh, discussed and they began to use the language of post-colonialism and this is that's the first thing that uh, started to happen that uh, the the language of post-colonialism infiltrated uh, other discourses other disciplines and um, the uh, talk about globalization transnationalism the cosmopolitan all these things were affected by the very uh, vibrant way in which post-colonial studies were taken up. And so uh, the language has developed uh, in, in particular ways. The, uh, lately, the, um, uh, the question keeps being asked, you know, isn't post-colonial, uh, isn't post-colonialism over? Isn't it ended, you know? I've been hearing that for 20 years. And, and of course, uh, it, it's still going strong. And the reason is the post-colonial theory, post-colonial reading, adapts itself to the changes in the power formations in the world today. You see, um, it's no longer relevant to talk about a 19th century European imperialism, but the, the forms of critique, uh, the forms of analysis and the forms of reading the post-colonial theory developed became extremely useful in discussing global issues and discussing the ways in which uh, different forms of empire uh, began to emerge uh, in the world. So while uh, post-colonial theory uh, has adapted, it has adapted to, uh, to cope with and to address the, uh, the changing nature of, of imperial power. Uh, what we call, see, empires don't exist as they did in the old days. They don't uh, exist geographically, but um, the, uh, the empire of ideas the empire of cultural power, the empire of technological power, and above all, the empire of e economic power are still uh, prevalent in the world. And uh, those are forms of power that uh, the whole world is colonized by. No, that's what I had in mind, uh, because I was particularly thinking of the binary that was talked about earlier. Yes. That's you right. have the colonizer on the one hand yeah. and the colonized on the other hand because yeah. even uh, Edward said yeah. subscribe to this. Yeah. But then uh, for us in India, we have uh, discovered along the way mm. that this binary doesn't work. No, that's the post-colonial right. elite yeah. is the enemy of the vast sections of po people in yes. India who have been the underdogs for a long time. That's right. Uh, people from the lower castes, Dalits, yes. minorities. Yeah. So this binary I think is being overturned on a large scale in post-colonialism. I think that's studies. true. I think that uh, it's matched by a geometric view of the world, where you have the center and margin. Mm -hmm. Now, the world is not, not really like that. The center exists everywhere, mm -hmm. and so does the margin. And um, these, it, it's more uh, a formation I'd call rhizomatic, which is like the, the sh bamboo shoots. They, they uh, spread everywhere. And, um, and so, 
this idea of the binary of colonizer and colonized uh, is being uh, addressed and, and subverted by post-colonial uh, reading. And it's, um, it's interesting that we see the way in which power works doesn't isolate uh, the powerful and the powerless in those simple ways. And I think that um, post-colonial reading has provided uh, some ways of understanding that. Issues of, say, of transculturality, you know, the, the, the contact zone, the, the zone in which both uh, uh, dominated and dominator uh, change. And so uh, the whole world has become a contact zone with the uh, influence of the internet and uh, the spread of globalization. You know. So this uh, again, I think is an issue. So when you talk about utopia, so you did yeah. early in the day. So uh, I think you mentioned the neoliberal utopia also at the end. Yes. As yet another kind of uh, That's utopia. Right. That's right. So uh, I don't think postcolonial studies in the beginning interrogated uh, neoliberal uh, or uh, no, let us say right. globalized yeah. economies. I think this is something that has happened afterwards. Right. That's right. Yes, that's right. A and also, of course, uh, postcolonial studies has only recently, in a book that's coming out by me, uh, thought of the concept of utopianism. Mm -hmm. The Utopian Studies Society began in the late 80s at the same time as postcolonial uh, theory began to emerge, and they're only now coming together. And the interesting thing about that is that uh, we see that postcolonial writers and artists have a particular facility for uh, imagining the world in a different way, you know. Uh, Pre-independence writers and intellectuals had a utopian view of what life would be like once independence came, but once it came, they were the sombre realities started to uh, to, to sink in. But nevertheless, uh, writers have a view of the the future that is um, an, an imagined future, a view of the possible that enables uh, people to critique the present. See, every utopian um, view, every form of utopianism, is a either explicit or implicit critique of present conditions. And most often they're in the post-colonial world, they're uh, critiques of the nation state, of the e economic structure that the nation state uh, is complicit in. And so this is one way in which uh, post-colonial studies is developing. Um, as I said, the, uh, the 19th century European empires are no longer relevant, but imperialism still remains relevant in the world today. Neo-imperialism, the imperialism of failed utopias. And when I uh, mention the word utopia in relation to neoliberalism, I mean that that shows us that achieved utopias are always dystopian. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, uh, we, we need to imagine a world that's different. And post-colonial writers have been doing that mm -hmm. for a very long time. Ever since the early independence days when they began to critique the nation state, um, they uh, developed a view of the possible uh, outcomes of social change, of cultural change, of cultural activism, which have been very, very potent in the world. And to me, that's one of the, the great uh, benefits of post-colonial writing. They had that history, they had the, that uh, memory of a, of a different kind of past that drove a vision of the future. And that's the way in which um, the writing of formerly colonized people can intervene to change the world, I believe, because um, we, are, we live in a world where uh, there is no, you know, centre margin, no dominated dominator in that simple sense. There's a, an infusion and a, a blurring that, uh, that means that some of the concepts of post-colonial reading have become very relevant. Yeah. So uh, I was also thinking of uh, what happens if uh, you don't have a utopia to imagine. Uh, is imagining a utopia central to human cultures? If you, if you look at yeah, this well, way. You know, I, um, I, I really believe that uh, the 
uh, Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch, who wrote a magn magnum opus of three volumes called The Principle yeah, of Hope. Yeah, and he starts with the view that imagining the future of looking forward is fundamental to human life. And so whether it's explicit or not, a critique of the present, uh, there is always a, an imagining of a different kind of world. Now this is particularly interesting in Indian writing. Uh, you see, I'm very interested in the post-Rushdi novel, Indian novel, and what we see is that those principles generated by Rabindranath Tagore and Mohandas Gandhi, um, a, a critique of the nation, a view of, of society that existed beyond the nation, have come to infuse contemporary writers, yeah. you know, they, because they critique the nation state for its um, uh, demonstration of power, for its, um, you know, for, for, for the kinds of oppression that simply continue the, the practices of the colonial state. So what we see in that is a view of a different kind of India, uh, a kind of India where the, the structures and the uh, stratifications that are uh, endorsed by the the, uh, the nation-state dissolve. So in their writing, which critiques the nation-state, there's a view of a different kind of India. Yeah. And whether it's explicit or not, you know, I think imaginative writing is by its nature utopian because it has the capacity to anticipate a different kind of world. And that's where post-colonial writing is particularly uh, significant, particularly pertinent, because it has a long history of engagement with power. And uh, the, the history of uh, any post-colonial writer is a long uh, history of, of power engagements. And so I think that's where post-colonial writing can have something to say about the, the present state of the world and neo-imperial structures. So uh, I think finally I should ask a very mischievous question. Yeah. That is, uh, would you like the discipline to be called by the same name because post-colonials because in translation studies for example recently yeah. some of the exponents have questioned the uh, oh, right. very name yes. they would say that you should call it adaptation studies because that's uh, what's happening all over the world right, right. not transfer. <laughs> so would you say that there is a case for a name change you know the problem with post-colonial that that name has existed from the very beginning you know, people thought that post meant after, but of course, uh, post-colonial means after invasion, not after independence. Colonialism never ends, but in the sense that uh, the problem with uh, the name has been part of the vitality of uh, post-colonial studies. People who call themselves post-colonialists begin by critiquing the field and say, "Well, we need a, another term," but somehow the term won't die, and the reason is post-colonial readings have adapted themselves to all forms of uh, transnational, world, global uh, formations of power. And diasporic, you know, uh, movements, these are all uh, accessible uh, to the, um, the operations of post-colonial reading. And so, you know, I have no particular investment in maintaining the name. But I think uh, it just seems to hang on, you know, yeah. and it's, there must be a reason for that. And I think the reason is that that field, post-colonial studies, is itself so adaptable yeah. and its capacity to read the operations of power so, um, so capable of adapting to different uh, conditions. Okay, uh, so uh, would you say that uh, writers in India after, uh, let's say, 19... 90s, because right. that is when the when your book yes. got published. Whether they have adapted themselves to the necessity to engage newer forms of uh, post-colonial uh, theory, post-colonial mm. experience. Yes, well, you know that's an interesting question because what it uh, what it implies is that forms of writing adapt themselves to forms of reading, and I think that's very much the case. See, I think what happened with um, post-colonial writing was it uh, was given voice in a sense by the knowledge that there was this 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 discourse this discipline I was um, I was at a conference once where a Dalit woman said 
Um, the Empire writes back enabled us to speak and I was very moved by that and I think that uh, what uh, what it suggests is that when you have a, a, a discourse like postcolonial studies which itself is a way of reading uh, then ways of writing themselves are energized by the knowledge that they are part of a corpus of works uh, not just in India but but worldwide you know that um, uh, are able to address these these issues of, um, of, of imperial and colonial power in, in all its forms. So yeah, I think that uh, from the 90s this this definitely started to happen. But but also I think from earlier, from about the time of Midnight's Children, they developed a um, a, a strand in uh, Indian writing of critique of the nation state which itself was utopian but saw itself in a sense as post-colonial as adapting the colonial language to represent uh, Indian life and it's had a powerful effect on the world it's actually transformed English literature itself so uh, a question which is related to this is uh, what is your take on uh, works which have been translated into English say from uh, we have some 25 languages major yeah. languages in India so have you yeah. come across well anything that is my of course my interest has always been uh, literature is written in English because I teach in an English department and it was uh, literatures in English from which a post-colonial writing uh, emerged but what is interesting is that now even works in translation have had the same effect of being recog of recognizing themselves as part of a corpus. So I think um, the translation of works can also be read in post-colonial ways. It's most obvious, of course, when the writer's writing in English because they're, they're appropriating a dominant language to represent themselves, and that's a very important form of resistance and transformation. But the, um, <clears throat> the ways in which uh, indigenous particularly in the Indian indigenous uh, literatures are translated also have a powerful effect uh, upon readers uh, throughout the world. There's an interesting um, case in which uh, Malayalam writers uh, became, be, because they became exposed to in English literature, uh, began to develop a Malayalam literature which has kind of faded out. So it's a, a curious thing that, uh, you know, the, the presence of uh, writing in English actually encouraged Malayalam writers to develop uh, an indigenous literature. So it's not a kind of, it's not a conflict, I think. And translated uh, works are also uh, important in uh, the post-colonial corpus and can be read in that way, you know. But remember, post-colonial theory is not uh, a grand theory of everything. In, it doesn't mean that just because a novel's written in India that is automatically can be read as post-colonial, but most often it can, and uh, and that's uh, that's I think a, a testament to the power of the discourse and also the adaptability and versatility and also the imaginative nature of Indian writers. So that's about India. Uh, what would you say the situation is in uh, let us say countries which are less known, for example, China? Right. which did not have a proper <coughs> history of colonization, but no. yet it had. Yeah. After the Boxer Rebellion, after the yeah. 1850 war, yeah. in which China virtually, uh, um, I mean, uh, accepted British yeah. suzerainty. Yeah. So would you say there is a case for a kind of post-colonial literature emerging in a country like China, or Afghanistan? Even? Well, I, I, definitely, I definitely see a case for post-colonial reading of China. You see, the... Um, the China has a very big chip on its shoulder about uh, the uh, you know uh, the 19th century and being colonised about the treaty ports yeah. and about uh, the Opium Wars, um, and 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 rightly so. But uh, I see China not so much as colonised by Europe as being an example of an internal colonialism. Yeah. Uh, there are 53. Uh, ethnicities, ethnic Within languages China. in China, and they are all dominated by the empire of yeah. the Han no. in, 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 uh, in China itself. 
And so I think that this is where it gets interesting that you can uh, see a post-colonial uh, literature emerging uh, in ethnic languages, but even more in languages written in uh, Putonghua. And the most interesting person in that respect is a, a poet called Beidao, mm -hmm. who wrote uh, extremely uh, abstract verse that seemed to, that the state criticized because they couldn't really understand it. Mm -hmm. But it was actually very critical of the imperial power of, uh, of the Chinese uh, ruling elites. And so in this way, post-colonial reading can adapt itself to forms of the operation of power in China. They have a particularly cult you know, post-colonial cultural dimension because of the, the uh, uh, rule of the, the Han uh, ethnicity, but they also um, can be read in terms of the operations of power that occur within China itself. You know, when you have migrants who come into the city to work, those migrants are displaced and they're oppressed or they're poorly paid. And so you have an internal diaspora within China uh, as well as uh, an operation of a neo-imperial power. So China's a particularly interesting case, but and especially as it becomes more and more uh, affluent. You know, we'll see um, the development of an internal empire that's uh, quite interesting. China's never had a, uh, a designs of a, um, a geographic empire. It's more uh, uh, incremental, you know, takes over Tibet, it wants to take over the Spratly Islands, yeah. you know. And so it's got, uh, it's got a very interesting imperial uh, energy about it. But in terms of the literature, I think we can definitely definitely see a literature emerging that uh, can be read in a post-colonial way. Okay. So in fact, we have this problem in India. We have two kinds of colonization. Right. The one uh, which is uh, the normal thing, usual yeah. thing, yeah. Yeah, you, and also internal colonization, right. as, as happened in China. Yeah. So we do have nationalities. That's right. We have the people on the northeast. That's we right. have uh, tribal communities yeah. who have never been subjugated. All those are happening after decolonization. I think it's true. I've often heard uh, in Kerala and South India and uh, in general that uh, they've been colonized by the Hindi yeah. and, and the Hindu and the plains people. Yes. Colonizing tribals. Right. The plains people colonizing tribal people, yeah. And so there's a continual uh, uh, operation of um, colonization going on. And I think that's, that's interesting. It's what's even more interesting in that is very often uh, English, which is the power, uh, the, the the language of the colonizing, colonizing power, mm -hmm. becomes the sort of uh, 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 neutral uh, mid language, you know, for between the the um, uh, languages which are striving for um, dominance over in each other, in which you can assert yes. uh, postcoloniality. Yes, so yeah, so. Uh, so, you know, the, India, it's uh, like China, India, because of its size and complexity, is a very interesting example of external and internal colonialism and, uh, and the operations of power. But also, India, much more than China, uh, shows a very vital and vibrant uh, literary culture. Uh, well, let me say post-colonial literary culture. Uh, of course, there's a Chinese literary culture, but that's only just very, very vestigial at the moment, developing. But India, with a long history of um, colonial experience, of imperial power, has developed a very vibrant uh, literature that, as I am often like to repeat, has transformed the discipline of English literature itself. So that was uh, Professor Bill Ashcroft uh, in this edition of uh, Interface. So we have uh, had a very interesting uh, discussion on postcolonialism, uh, how it uh, changes its contours as time passes, how it is realized, it is positioned in different ways in different societies. So I think we should uh, all thank uh, Professor Ashcroft for this wonderful session. Thank you.